I am pleased to be here today. <laughs> Heavenly Father said I could come. I, you know, you are my kin. I watch you, you know. My name is Amasa Mason Lyman. I have, I was born with no patronage but poverty, no home but the world. I say that because my father never built a house. When I was little, we lived with my grandparents, the Masons, Martha and Perez, in New Hampshire. And my father left the home when I was very young, went to help his brother in New York. His brother got better, but he never, but my father never returned. We heard a few years later that he had died, been shot in New Orleans. My mother remarried and left me, same with my parents, my, my grandparents, and I helped take care of them. When I was about 10 years old, my grandmother passed away, and just before I turned 12, my grandpa, Perez Mason, passed away. Mother had me go live with, still in New Hampshire with Uncle Parley, and I was to help him on the farm. For seven years, I worked myself to death helping Uncle Parley. He was a rather severe old man. When I was 19, we heard that the Mormon missionaries were coming to town. I was kind of excited about it. Uncle Parley would have nothing to do with it, so I had to sneak out. I went and I listened to them on the streets, and I listened to them in the fields. Lyman Johnson was the missionary that I was most interested in, because he had the same first name as my last name. And Orson Pratt also was one of the teachers. And I listened carefully to them before long. A testimony developed in my heart that the church of Jesus Christ was being restored on the earth. Hallelujah. Uncle Parley didn't want to hear anything about it. Lyman Johnson baptized me. Orson Pratt confirmed me a member of the church. And Uncle Parley kicked me out of the house. Well, I gathered up all of my stuff, what little I had, and made the 700-mile trip over a few weeks, several weeks, and got myself to Kirtland, Ohio. There, I got to live with my missionary's family, the John Johnson family. Father Johnson, I called him. When I got there, Emma was living there. Emma Smith, with her daughter, Julie Murdoch, who uh, she had adopted. Unfortunately, she had lost her son, Joseph, just a month or two earlier, Joseph Murdoch. He got exposed to the elements while he had measles when they tarred and feathered Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon from that very house. Why would they tar and feather Joseph Smith, you wonder? The month before, just after I got baptized, they had received the visions of glory, about the three degrees of glory. They told the saints not to tell anybody about it, but the word got out, and the neighbors were furious. They didn't want anything to do with such doctrine. So they took it in their own hands to do away with Joseph. They were going to kill him, actually, and Sidney. They failed, and Joseph was unfazed. The next day, he preached from the porch of the John Johnson home. By the time I got there, he had left. He was establishing Zion in Independence, Missouri. Father Johnson put me up working on the farm for $10 a day, and I worked and, and waited until Joseph got back about a month later. When I first met him, I got to shake his hand. It was such a cordial handshake. But he was no different from any other man, really. He was 26 years old. I was 19. But when I took his hand, I felt as one of old in the presence of the Lord. And I came to know in my heart that he is the man of God. After a few weeks, I was ordained an elder and Joseph said to me, Heavenly Father has a need for you. And he sent me on a mission. I went to Southern Ohio. I went over to New York. I was on a mission for oh, a year and a half when I was visiting the Bolton home of Father John Tanner. John Tanner had a huge estate in Bolton, New York. And as I was visiting with him, I heard word from Lyman Johnson that Joseph Smith had called us back to help restore the saints in Independence because they had been driven out the winter before from Independence, Missouri, and they were stuck over towards Liberty, Missouri in the cold with hardly anywhere to live. So Father Tanner sent some wagons, and Nathan Tanner came with me. 
my brother-in-law to be and another brother and we went and joined Joseph's party called the Camp of Israel and we traveled west all the way through Illinois all the way through Missouri joined up with Hiram's camp and eventually headed towards Independence uh, Missouri along the way I got talking to George Smith he had also been baptized the same year as me was quite a bit younger and it turned out we were second cousins. His mother, Clarissa Lyman, was my father, Roswell Lyman's first cousin. Now since George Smith was the first cousin of Joseph Smith, that made me a relative of Joseph Smith by marriage. I also got to talk with Bishop Edward Partridge. He had come to meet us at the Grand River. He was the bishop in Zion and he had uh, charge of all of those saints who have been driven across the Missouri River to the other side, the Liberty side. I walked along and talked with him for a whole day, hearing about the deprivations and deprecations of the saints in independence. And I also learned a lot about his family, which were mostly girls. Well, we finally got almost to Liberty, and... Uh, Joseph was quite disappointed to find out that the Missouri militia had decided that they weren't going to support us anymore in restoring the saints to their homes in independence. Joseph prayed about it, and he received a revelation saying, send those saints up north instead to far west, and you get back to Kirtland where there's trouble with the temple brewing. He sent me and some of the other young men up north to help the saints settle in far west Missouri, while he went rapidly back to Kirtland. I as was told in the Revelation, preached along the wayside on my return for five months. I finally got to Kirtland late in 1834, and I discovered that John Tanner was there with his whole family. He had sold his 1,100-acre property in Bolton and brought enough money to redeem the mortgage on the Kirtland Temple. So they were able to keep building the Kirtland Temple. Oh, my goodness, what a joy. And even a greater joy, I was quite interested in his daughter, Maria. I wrote her a little note. And in the note I said, Dear Louisa Maria, would you be willing to converse with me on the topic of matrimony? And she replied to my letter with another letter on the bottom of which she said, Yes, I would. <laughs> well, we had that talk. We had that talk. and. Two weeks later, we were married by Seymour Bronson. It wasn't enough that I was just married. Joseph Smith had ordained me a high priest. He sent me on another mission. Maria had to stay behind with Father Tanner, stayed in his home. I went on a mission to New York and Virginia and, uh, and, and Vermont and Philadelphia, and finally came back on December of eight, in December of 1835 for a conference that Joseph had called, wherein he said, Tarry for a while in Kirtland and prepare for the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Three months later, the dedication occurred. I was there. Maria was there. The Kirtland Temple was dedicated to be the house of God, the first temple in this dispensation. There was fire. There were angels. The singing was magnificent. Thousands of people crowded into the temple to get to attend this dedication, even though only hundreds were, could fit. We received our endowments of power, the washing and the anointing. Jesus Christ himself was there. In fact, he came and appeared to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, together with Elias, Elijah, and Moses, who restored the keys of the gathering of the house of Israel, the preaching of the gospel to all the world, and the keys of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, the sealing power, as we later came to find out. I was immediately sent on another mission and then another. But I came home in 1835 only to find out that the saints in Kirtland and the citizens of Kirtland had all turned sour against the church. Very few people supported the church anymore. Joseph was basically being driven out. He took Emma, I took Maria, we traveled together to far west Missouri. Settled there, had 40 acres, built my first log cabin. But then, 
After a year, trouble broke out there too. Now you've heard about the Mormon War in Missouri in your Sunday school classes, but probably not from my point of view. When Joseph heard about the troubles in Gallatin at the boating booths up north, he sent me and five others to go spy out and see what was going on up there. We rode our horses on up to Gallatin, checked things out, came brought boat, word back to Joseph. And then he said, oh, there's not much we can do up there. We're having trouble over in DeWitt. So he sent me as a spy over to DeWitt. Now, that was dangerous territory because the Missourians over to the east were really mob-ocratic. And so I had to go in disguise, of course. So I put on me little red cap and me <laughs> buffalo robe and me gray pants. And got me a old bottle of whiskey to put in my pocket. These are like soldier pants, see? <laughs> I had to pull him over my bum knee. <laughs> yeah. Pulled up my soldier pants. My big boy pants. Yeah. And I went and disguised like a Missourian. I was a Missourian, yep. With, uh, can't quite get that buckled. With my bottle of whiskey in my pocket. Oh, my pants are on backwards. <laughs> and I got me a boat and I floated down the Missouri River all the way to DeWitt with my partner. When we got there, it was too late. The saints are being kicked out of DeWitt. They were headed up north where the saints were allowed to dwell. But pretty soon before we knew it, we got captured by the mob. And they took us with them towards far west. They had this big old cannon. They were going to blow the whole city up with this cannon. They made me push the cannon and ride on the cannon. And I just held my peace and hoping I wouldn't get my family blown up before I knew it. Fairly while longer, they let me go, and they, but they wouldn't let us go with the other saints. They made us go back the way we came. So we circled around and we came over to far west. I was there about a day. Got to visit with my wife a little bit, Maria, when I was caught out in front of Bishop Edward Partridge's house. He was the bishop in Far West, too, just like he had been in Independence, the Bishop of Zion, Edward Partridge. They threw me in prison. They threw Joseph and Hiram and some of the other church leaders in prison, about six or seven of us. And General, Major General Sam Lucas issued the edict that we were to be executed, shot at dawn. Again, afraid for my family, I worried until I heard that General Alexander Donovan had said, I won't execute that order. That would be cold-blooded murder. Cap General Lucas backed down. He sent us and about 500 of the Fathers of Zion down to Independence, where all of our enemies were. And they paraded us through the streets like some kind of trophies that they had won and then they put us in the independence jail and finally shipped us thanks to party you got to change the venue shipped us over to the east to richmond jail you might have heard of richmond jail probably not that much but you might have heard a little about it richmond jail was dark and it was dank and we were chains in chains just the seven or eight of us the 500 got sent back to far west i was chained on one side of the prophet parley p pratt was chained on the other those guards were horrible. They talked all night in a drunken state about how they had murdered the children in Far West and raped the wives and burned the houses. We, of course, were furious. But Joseph Smith held his calm until one night about midnight. He couldn't hold his calm anymore, apparently, and he stood up to his full height and said to those to those guards, silent, ye fiends of the infernal pit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to be silent this moment, or either you or I die this instant. 
guards were quavering. They didn't say another word all night. I was quavering too. But I've often wondered how Joseph knew either he or they would die that instant. You wondered that? I don't know, but I've never known him to tell a lie. He always tells the truth. Well, after a few weeks, a few of us were released. Joseph was sent over to Liberty Jail. I tried to get him out several times. Other saints did, but finally we were stuck up in Far West. The Bobocrats were attacking us. The winter was coming in on us. And Brigham Young, the head of the 12 apostles, says, we have to get out of here. We need to go back east. And they took us clear through to Quincy. I stayed behind, held some of the saints, sell their property, got, met my wife Matilda and my daughter Matilda in Quincy. We went up to Commerce. And there, Joseph finally got out of jail, came, met us, and renamed it Nauvoo. You've heard of Nauvoo. A lot happened in Nauvoo. I was, re I was made an apostle of the church, made a regent of the University of Nauvoo. I helped build a town for Joseph Smith called Shehokan, up north in the northern part of Illinois, right up by the border with Wisconsin. I had me a property in Nauvoo, 40 acres. It was a big, beautiful piece of property. And... Uh, I followed the prophet, learning about the gospel. He would send me on a mission, and then I would come back. I was on a mission in New York uh, in 1844 to help uh, campaign for him to become president so that he could redress all of the wrongs of the saints in Missouri. He had sent Sydney to Pennsylvania. I was in Syracuse, headed to Boston one day, June 27th it was, when I felt a very dark feeling come over me. Depression, sadness, I couldn't identify it, but I figured it out two weeks later when I got word from Lyman Johnson that the prophet had been martyred that day with his brother Hiram. I rushed back together with all the other apostles to Nauvoo. Brigham was there, Sydney was there, they called a meeting, it was August 6th, they put all of us up on the stand. I was the counselor to the first presidency, that's why I was on the stand. Sydney spoke all morning, had all kinds of things to tell the people about why he would be a great replacement for Joseph Smith, being the counselor in the first presidency. But Joseph had told the apostles previously that they were to follow him. If the first presidency, any one of them were killed, if the president were killed, it was to be dissolved and the apostles were to take over. So after Sidney had spoken four hours, Brigham got up and said, now it's up to you saints to know whether you want somebody who will run the church or whether you want a prophet. He called on me, Amasa, he said, would you please voice your mind to the people, whatever you feel is right. So I stood up in front of all those tens of thousands of saints in Nauvoo, and I said, I'm not here to electioneer, implying that Sidney was. I will put my weight behind the twelve and be saved. Then I sat down and Brigham stood up. You may have heard what happened next. While he was speaking, it appeared that he had the voice of Joseph Smith coming out of him. Some people saw the face of Joseph Smith on him. Many people felt strongly that they should follow the 12 apostles the way Brigham was directed to and was telling them to. Well, Sidney went off in a huff to form his own church in Pennsylvania, and the rest of us stayed there in Nauvoo. We finished the temple, the Nauvoo temple, and I helped with the endowments through December and January and February of 1845 and 46, 5,000 people, 5,500 we gave endowments to in the upper story of the Nauvoo Temple. And then Brigham finally said, we've got to get out of here before the ice breaks on the Mississippi River. But they said, no, no, we're not done yet. So we did another week. And then he said, now we really have to go. And so off across the river we went. We ended up in Iowa. And you probably have heard many stories about how Getting across Iowa was such a disaster. We finally got there in time to be in winter quarters for that winter. Next spring, I was in the second party, the second group of 10, with Ezra Taft Benson as the leader, 
headed it with the Vanguard Party with 127 pioneers to Utah. Now there were many uh, errands that I had to do along the way, but I arrived in the Salt Lake Valley about the same time as the other pioneers. And when I got there on July 27th, a few days later, Brigham Young called a meeting of the pioneers that were there. He had uh, me speak to them, among others, and he asked me to say how I felt about that location. I felt like Brigham Young did. I knew that he had received a, a vision that we were to settle the Salt Lake Valley. And so I said to the people, this is the place. From there, I was sent on other missions. I had all of my wives with me at this time. They were sealed to me in the Nauvoo Temple just before we left. The eight, anyway, that came with us. And they stayed behind while I was sent on a mission first to San Francisco, and then we were all sent down to San Bernardino. We built a whole city there. We stayed there for several years, building up that city. But in the middle of the 1850s, we were asked to come back so that we could help stave off Johnston's army, who we thought were coming to annihilate the Mormons because of, of the Utah problem. They weren't there to do that, but we had quite a bit of to-do about it. Then I was sent on a mission to Europe, and I got to be the president of the mission of Europe with my friend from San Bernardino, Charles Rich, and he and I served the Lord there. Now you might have heard that after I got back from Europe and uh, was sent up and down the Mormon corridor preaching about my mission there, that I started to get into some trouble with the apostles. Namely, the apostles had realized that there was too much false doctrine being preached. Something had to be done about it. And it wasn't everybody, but several of us had gone off on different kinds of tangents. They called me on the carpet. I repented at first. They called me on the carpet for preaching about the blood of Christ. I had been saying, it's not necessary for salvation. We don't need blood atonement. What we need is to be obedient. That's what we need if we want to be saved. That didn't sit well with the apostles who realized it didn't, didn't fit with the scriptures. Well, I first repented, but then I balked, and then I got proud, and then I got mad, and I resisted, and I fought against the church, and I turned against Brigham Young, and I fought every way I could. Finally, I came down to Fillmore. I was sent down to Fillmore to be with my family. I was getting old. I was getting tired fell off the scaffolding, broke my leg, couldn't hardly move, I was so overweight. I was getting old and sick of malaria, I'd had the ague so many times in my life. And before I knew it, my time had come. Found myself on the other side. I was met by my mother, Martha Mason Lyman. She said, son, I love you, but you have to go to a sad place, across the chasm. Well, I was not happy. I was not happy over there for a long time. For two decades, I was over there. I wanted to preach the gospel. That's all I'd ever done all my life was preach the gospel. But being damned, I couldn't preach. Oh, it was hard. I begged Heavenly Father, can't there be some way that I can get out of here? He let me go to Martha Roper, my daughter, and appeared to her in a dream. And I said, Martha, called to her across the chasm, Martha, please help me get out of here. I'm so tired of this old black suit and these old black boots. I just want to be able to preach again. Marion can do something about it. He was an apostle. Ask Marion to help me. Not too long after that, I also got to appear to Marion in a few dreams. And before long, he approached the church leadership and asked if I could not be reinstated to have my blessings back. Joseph F. Smith said it sounds like he served his time. His time has come. But it was still another year before finally, happy day, John Henry Hanks baptized Marion on my behalf and... Then after that, Joseph F. Smith laid his hands 
on Marion's head and confirmed me vicariously a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and sealed upon me the priesthood power, all of the blessings, all of the sealing power that I had received during my lifetime. Now, you will have to wait to see what became of my wives who left me when I lost my membership in the church and how all that plays out. That's to be a mystery for now. I just want to say this to you. Be true to the whisperings of the Spirit. Be loyal to the prophet. Be faithful to the scriptures and understand them. Don't go wandering off into false paths. It's foolish. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your attention. This is kind of hot. Um, yeah. <laughs> May I say that uh, the first time you did this down here at Fillmore, back in 53, you were really good. Yeah. I want to tell you, when you bring tears to this old cowboy's eyes, you're a lot better. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And backwards. Wait, are these ones in zoom? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> There's other ones for you. What the brought you in now? Okay. Um, Evelyn Corning. Are you here? Hi. So glad you could come. Is a great great granddaughter of Maria Tanner Lyman through her second son, Amos and Mason Lyman Jr. Sister of Rosemary. Amos Jr. Loved, being, loved the most remote places he could find, so he was always moving around, southern Utah. It, wasn't, it isn't surprising that great-grandpa and his wife family were the first family to homestead Boulder, Utah. I grew up 30 miles away in Escalante. I am married, and my husband Jim Corning and I have five wonderful children and seven terrific grandchildren. We have lived in Tucson, Arizona for over 30 years. I have a degree in elementary education and have authored a book and quite a number of magazine articles. I love researching and writing family histories and spending time outdoors with my family and friends. Now, just like she may be going to do with Louisa Mariah, often they call Maria, I, I channeled her in the first person because that's how it was written. <laughs> she will now <laughs> present a vignette on Louisa Mariah. Actually, she has a lot to present. And I hope there's enough time. Let's give her a hand. Evelyn Corner. I figured out I get a microphone to work too. Wow, awesome. You know, why would you dare to follow something like this when you're not an actress? Nobody would be so foolish, would they? That was so wonderful. So I'm gonna do it not the vignette that maybe you would have imagined, but uh, one that I felt like my talents could use and could display. So this is my son Bryce, he's gonna help me. He, I have, um, I've really um, enjoyed this opportunity to just be here and I hope you'll learn a little more about Mariah than maybe you knew before. She's um, not, you know, sometimes the wives aren't as well, kno well known as the husbands, so it's a little harder to find the information, but I think that she is a very fascinating woman, and so I hope you'll enjoy it. As soon as Bryce is ready to hear some, I'm a really visual person, so I decided I like to see photos, I like to see pictures, and so I decided I wanted to do this with a PowerPoint so that you could see some of these places and people that I'm talking about because it makes it more real to me. Excuse so. me for a second. We need to move that way a little bit yeah. so we can you get you. Me. We need you and the pictures. Okay, you say when. That's great. Okay, do you want me then do you want this as well? Yeah, I really want you to use them. Okay, is that good? 
and you might want to hold the mic. Oh, yeah. It just needs it's to be closer to her. You'll just have to have it right, right up against your mouth. Right to oh, yeah. 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 There we go. That's really close. Again, I'd like to share with you a quote by Elder Bradley D. Foster of the 70s, and his words changed my approach to family history. He wrote, the gravestones of any cemetery in the world contain the name, a birth date, a dash, and the death date. That little dash between our birth and our death seems to be so small and insignificant, but it's our whole history that lies within it. So while we often focus on the discovering those dates, our love of ancestors and turning of our hearts to our fathers comes from discovering the dash. Family history brings us together as we share stories and work together. Therefore, genealogy changes our charts, but it's family history that changes our hearts. I really struggled with this assignment. I didn't want to give a travel log of Mariah's life. She lived here and gave birth there and so on and so on. Instead, I wanted to find personal comments about her, stories and other items that would help me and you discover her dash and what lies within it. I prayed for directions. I've been awakened many nights with promptings to just search again. I have requested her patriarchal blessing but was told that it was in historical review and was unavailable. I have read and reread the histories written about Mariah by others. And finally, I have pondered just who is Mariah Tanner Lyman? Allison Mason Lyman Jr., Mariah's first child and my great grandfather, was often heard to say, My mother Tanner was, uh, my mother was a Tanner by name and a Tanner by nature. Great grandpa was a challenge, known to be in trouble at home. He considered himself the black sheep of the family. But I believe Mariah loved him and expected obedience from all her children, including Amasa Jr. Because Mariah was obedient to her promises and her covenances, she expected the same from her children. Great grandpa was saying that she was a strict mother but I think she was just teaching he and his siblings that some things in, in life require strict obedience. Others have written that Mariah Tanner Lyman was sparsely built and frail in appearance, had a cheery disposition and a great tenacity for life. Besides caring for her, her own eight children, she mothered six orphans and ministered to the comfort of loved ones and others Obedient, caring, tenacious, and a cheerful disposition were just some of those character traits of this amazing woman who lived and was part of the opening scenes of the restored gospel with all its hardships and miraculous manifestation. To understand Mariah, we must first know about her family background. Mariah's parents, John Tanner and Lydia Stewart, were married in the fall of 1801. John's first wife, Tabitha, had passed away giving birth to a son. John married Lydia soon afterwards. They lived in Greenwich, New York from 1801 to 1818. I should mention here, there are no photos of Mariah's parents. Um, on November 28th of that year, a baby girl was born in the, to the Tanners. John Tanner would record her name in his Bible as Mariah Loiza. However, at, throughout her life, Mariah would write her name in the reverse, Loisa Mariah. And that is the way you find it in Family Search. But did you notice that on the sl second slide, the name on her headstone is engraved as her father recorded it? In the spring of 1818, John and Lydia Tanner, with their family of five children and four others who had died, uh, died earlier, moved to the Northwest Bay, Bay off from Lake George in Warren County, New York. 
Lake George had been called one of the most beautiful lakes in America. The home was built in the community of Bolton. Mariah was the 10th child. This photo is of the family home in Bolton, New York, and taken in the 1960s. Later, the Tanner home was demolished in 2014, and this plaque has since been posted at its site. Mariah's mother, Lydia, had two more sons. She passed away at age 41 from complications of the last childbirth, and Mariah was seven years old at the time of her mother's death. John Tanner remarried six months later to Elizabeth Beswick. Elizabeth would raise the younger children of John's second marriage, as well as eight more children of her own. She would later write, I married John Tanner, his wife had died, leaving him with a large family of children. He had a comfortable home and was considered wealthy in that part of the country. This daguerreotype is probably the earliest photo of Mariah, believed to be taken in the 1850s. This second photo was taken at the Tanner reunion in, 19, in 1898 in Payson, Utah. Mariah is 88. Throughout her life, Mariah had the support of her family and her siblings. Um, Mariah and Amison, when they married, John Tanner accepted Amison as his own son. Mariah and her children stayed with her parents when they were in need of a home. And as Mariah's sons matured and needed employment to support the family, it was her brothers who helped. She learned the importance of family and taught that principle to her children. Family was certainly part of Mariah's legacy and a part of her dash as well. What about the gospel? What part did that play in Mariah's early life? John Tanner was a Baptist, and in 1832, he and his wife and children were introduced to the gospel. Skeptical at first, after reading the Book of Mormon and the miraculous healing of John's infected leg by the priest of blessing, their minds were changed, and the following day, um, John and Elizabeth were baptized in Lake George and confirmed at the water's edge by J Jared and Simon Carter. Elizabeth Tanner would later write, from that time on, our home was open to the, to the home of the elders who could come to that part of the, the country. What you might not know is that John and Elizabeth were not the first to be baptized in the family. Nathan Tanner, who was just um, three years older than Mariah, joined the church one week before his parents. Three months later, Mariah joined the church um, and Orson Pratt baptized her on Christmas Day in Lake George. She had just turned 15 years old. Eventually, all the living children of Elizabeth and John Tanner joined the church, but only four of Lydia's parent children became members. Choosing to be baptized on a cold Christmas day illustrates Mariah's tenacity. The gospel was true, and she was not willing to wait for a warm summer's day. Besides being her own, being a witness to her father's healing, she had studied and prayed and had her own testimony. She would be obedient to the teachings of the prophet, even though some teachings yet to come, such as plural marriage, were going to test her faith. Following Mariah's baptism, she traveled to Kirtland, Ohio. Her father had sold all his businesses and land and prepared to go to Ohio after receiving a spiritual impression that he and his family would join the saints in Kirtland. The family left on Christmas Day in 1834, exactly two years after Mariah's baptism. In a company of 40 wagons, Mariah traveled the snow barn bound trails 500 miles, arriving in Kirtland on Sunday, January 4, 1835. This exodus from Ryer's home in Bolton marked the first of many journeys that she would take as a member of the church. Immediately upon John Tanner's arrival in Kirtland, he loaned the prophet $200,000 to fulfill the mortgage payment on the land the temple was being built on. He gave the temple committee $13,000 and signed a note for $30,000 to purchase other goods and materials given to the church. This painting titled, Bless You Brother, Father Tanner, by artist Glenn Hopkinson, depicts this event 
And without a doubt, John Tanner's example of giving all he had for the gospel made a very lasting impression on his 16-year-old daughter, Mariah. The dedication of the Kirtland Temple occurred on March 27, 1836. It had been just a little over a year since the Tanners had arrived. <coughs> After the dedication on the 27th, the Prophet Joseph repeated the ceremonies for several days later. And as of early as January and continuing past the dedication, many church members witnessed the heavenly manifestations during this glorious season. Father Tanner and his family had contributed much toward the temple. However, I could not find any records or histories of either Mariah or her family during that period of heavenly appearances. Yet these events must have touched the family greatly. As new converts of only four years, Mariah and her family had met and been taught by the prophet Joseph Smith and were eyewitnesses to the dedication of the first temple in this dispensation. Maria's, Mariah's introduction to the newly restored gospel was both powerful and personal. Gospel truths were a part of that foundation of Mariah's dash. An early description of Mariah reads that she had blonde hair, a prominent nose, eyes that glow with feeling, and a blush that amplified her natural beauty. Fifteen-year-old Mariah had met Elder Amasa M. Lyman when he and his missionary companion stopped for food and lodging at the Tanner's home in Bolton in 1834. Like Mariah, Amasa had joined the church in 1832. They were both from the East, he from New Hampshire and she from New York. And Orson Pratt had confirmed both of them. But unlike Mariah, Amasa had no family support whether emotional or financial, since joining the church. He was a man without earthly means, whereas Mariah's family were considered to be very affluent. Emma stayed with the Tanners for five days. Their next lot, the next meeting took place a year later in the spring of 1835. Amasa returned from Zion's camp to find the Tanners living in this home in Kirtland, Mariah is 16, and apparently both she and Amasa had feelings for each other, because five days later, after Amasa's return, Mariah received this letter. It reads, Kirtland, Ohio, May 31st, 1835. Dear sister, while the mantle of night is spread around the works of nature, I take my pen that through its silent language I might communicate with you some of the feelings of my heart. Having been a wanderer and desiring to enjoy the blessings that would come from the society of a companion who would, fill, who would participate me in the changing scenes of life, if you would desire and feel willing to converse with me on the subject of matrimony, please write your answer below. It's my belief that I'd be happy in your company that I write you. Receive this from your friend a lineman to Miss L. M. Tanner. Please answer tomorrow. Unfortunately, the answer to this correspondent cannot be given. It was clipped from the bottom of the letter. However, we do know it was in the affirmative because they were married 11 days later on June 10, 1835. Five days after their wedding, Amasa received another mission assignment from the brethren and Mariah remained at her parents' home in Kirtland. From the time of their marriage in 1835 to the time Mariah departed for Salt Lake in 1848, she and her children would move at least 17 times. Only twice did she and her children have a home of their own. These moves covered four states, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana. It wasn't just the lack of a home for her children that concerned Mariah. It was also Amos's safety. Many of its church assignments and his missions put him in harm's way. The following is an example. About three years after their marriage, they were living in far west and local mobs were harassing the saints. Amasa and William Dunn were sent to warn the saints in the area. On his way home, Amasa was captured and given five minutes to get, say goodbye to his wife and daughter and get a change of clothing. Amasa would later write, 
I left, my, I left my weeping wife and prattling babe to encounter the fate of the land of my enemies. The Missouri militia leader told that Mariah that Amasa would be put to death. When Amasa walked out of that door that day, she feared he might never return. I believe faith and prayer taught Aunt Mariah through these trying times. But even cheerful Mariah had moments of discouragement, as we will see reflected in this letter. In the spring of 1840, Mariah Amasa secured a land nearby the Tanners and built a small cabin for his family. They lived there for about a year when Amasa was called again to serve. Mariah was lonely and writes to an unnamed friend. This letter is one of three letters written by Mariah that still remain. These letters are important because we hear Mariah's own words. You will notice, unlike Amasa's poetic writing, uh, Mariah is very plain spoken. She writes, the reason I have not written before, I had nothing good to write. We have either been harassed about or some of us sick. Our Amasa in prison, you have undoubted heard that the mob had him and some others chained in the Richmond jail for some time. He spent home but very little, and he travels and preaches a great deal, part, the great part of his time, as he's ever done since he joined the Mormon. Her words seem discouraged, and they're distant. The letter writing was, illustrates one way she could cope during this time. The remaining letters of Mariah certainly help us discover more about what is within her dash. 16-year-old Mariah was a beautiful bride filled with dreams of a happy marriage and a life with her new husband. In reality, Amasa and Mariah had only spent 21 days before marrying, five days in Bolton, New York when they first met, and 16 in Kirkland before they married. She and Amasa loved each other, and they wanted to be servants of the Lord. Their union would bring eight children, but in Mariah's eighth year of marriage, things changed. These are Mariah and Amasa's eight children. Matilda, in November of 1836, Mariah gave birth to her first child, a daughter she named Matilda after her older sister. Amasa was on assignment for the church and was not with Mariah at the time of the birth. Still without a home of her own, Mariah and Amasa are living in the home of Justice and Betsy Morris on January 12, 1840, when Mariah gives birth to her first son, Francis Marion, in Good Hope, Illinois. Mariah gives birth to her third set daughter, or her third child, Ruth Adela, on August the 1st, 1843, while Amasa is fulfilling a church assignment in Chicago, Illinois. Amasa Mason was born on February the 22nd, 1846, during the great exodus from Nauvoo. At the time of his birth, Amasa Sr. was across the river with his other wives at the home of Mariah's parents, the Tanners. Mariah Louisa was born June, May 8, 1849, while Mariah and young Amasa were living in a wagon box in what is today Holiday, Utah. <coughs> Lydia Deseret was born four months after the family arrived in San Bernardino, California on January 21st, 1852. Because of overcrowding, Mariah and her children moved into a small house Amasa had built just outside the stockade of San Bernardino, and it is there that Love Josephine was born on April the 25th, 1854. Agnes Adela Hilla uh, she went by her second name, was uh, Mariah's last child. She was delivered with the help of Mariah's new granddaughter, Rhoda, the wife of Francis Marion. When Mariah gave birth to Amasa was in Utah, preparing for the Utah War. This is the only photo of Mariah and her children. Three of her eight children had passed away when this photo was taken in 1903. Sometime in the spring of 1843, after Amasa had been called to be an apostle, Joseph Smith taught him the principle of plural marriage. From what I was able to gather from family members, 
Amasa had discussed plural marriage with Mariah, and after praying about it, they both agreed that Amasa would take another wife. Mariah, uh, Amasa's second wife was Dionetta Whitney. She was a widow, and her husband and children had all died in an epidemic. They married on July the 28th, 1843, three days before Mariah gave birth to her daughter Ruth. Within the next six, two years, Amasa married six other women. Just a note about this photo. This is a portrait by Celia Van Sickle. It hangs in the Salt Lake DUP building. She also painted Brigham Young and his first wife. These portraits were to hung in the foyer of the Nauvoo Temple, and similar photo, and there were similar photos, or portraits, I should say, of the other church leaders. But this one of Apostle Lyman, Mariah, and their son, Francis Marion, was never known to have been displayed in the temple. brought a dramatic change to Mariah's marriage and her personal life. These are my comments about Mariah, but I believe that plural marriage had the greatest impact upon the first wife. With that said, I also believe that Mariah tried her very best. This letter was written four years after Amos embraced plural marriage. I think it provides some insight into Mariah's feelings at this time. It reads, Winter Quarters, June 6th. 1847, respected companion. I take the liberty of writing, although not requested, to let you know of the health of your family, for I do not feel as though I could let this opportunity pass without proving, improving it. Your ladies are in good health. All are able to be out for meeting and other places today. I am now along with the children. They are all busy. Matilda is taking care of little Amasa. Marion is studying his book. Little Adela says, tell Papa I have learned my letters and can spell some. I am very anxious to see you, but your mission must be completed first. I have a first-rate company, those who are willing to do for me all that I could ask or wish. I enjoy myself very well, much better than I expected. And I feel, um, if you had a good woman with you, that was interested in you and take care of your things and do your work. If it was LML, the wise of Mariah Lyman, it, that was with you, it would please me very much. <laughs> I am truly thankful for the privilege of writing to you, although I make a bumbling work out of it. Next slide. The lack of housing, material support, and time with Amos, Amasa made Mariah's first eight years seem easy compared to what was in the future. And what was before Mariah and her children? Well, in 1848, she left Nauvoo with three small children and an infant son in her arms, but without Amasa, who had been assigned to travel in the advanced company. Then came we in her quarters and the death of little Ruth Adela, four years old. That summer, their family proceeded to the Great Salt Lake as part of the Willard Richard Company. The wagon train, when it entered uh, Salt Lake Valley, the family split up, and the oldest two children went to school, went to school, and lived with their aunts, while Mariah and her two chil younger children lived in a wagon box for a year and a half. Later, she found permanent shelter in a crude log cabin for a year. Amazon and Char Charlie Charles Rich were called to colonize Southern California in 1851. Mariah and her family departed with about 500 other pioneers. Six years later, the Utah War began, and everyone in the San Bernardino colony were told to return to Utah. Upon Mariah's arrival, her, fam only, her family's only shelter was, some abandoned, was an abandoned shack in Cedar City, Utah. Two years later, the family moved to Beaver. Utah, where they lived for three years while Amasis presided over the European mission. In 1862, church leaders instructed Amasa and his wives and families to move to Fillmore, Utah. 
Here Amasa began to, the construction of homes for his wives. Then eight years later came Amasa's excommunication as an apostle in 1870. I have found two references that provide some insight to Mariah's feelings about plural marriage as she grew older. The first one is a newspaper article in 1872, which would be about five years before Amasa dies. Briefly, the article states that more than 400 Utah women sent a petition to Congress requesting that the territory not be admitted to the state as long as the church was still practicing plural marriage. The 1872 petition was created and circulated by the spiritualists, the Godbeites, who were seeking to remove the political and economic power of Utah from Brigham Young. The article also contained the list of the names of the signers, including Mariah and two of her daughters. The second source is a quote taken from Leo, uh, Edward Leo Lyman's book, Amos and Mason Lyman, Mormon Apostle and Apostate. The quote reads, there is no record of Mariah's response to this new practice, referring to plural marriage. But in 1890, when Mariah and her daughter-in-law Rhoda learned about the Woodford Manifesto, withdrawing support from the new plural marriages, the two women, Mariah and Rhoda, threw their arms around Alice and wept with joy that she would never have to endure the anguish of seeing her husband bring home another wife. Mariah lived for 29 years after Amos' death, outliving all but two of the plural wives. In total, Mariah had spent 73 years in a family relationship of plural wives. You have to agree Mariah understood this subject. I believe as a younger woman, she entered into plural marriage with strict obedience. And as an older woman, she seemed to no longer support it. Had plural marriage gone on too long, did she believe it produced more harm than harmony? This I do know, from all indications, Mariah's attitude about plural marriage changed, and for at least the last 35 years of her life, it appears she is no longer in favor of it. Only two of Mariah's seven adult children, Francis Marion Lyman and Mariah Louisa, choose, chose to be in a plural, relation, plural marriage relationship. Mariah never left Amasa throughout her marriage. She stood by him and prayed for him since she was a 16-year-old bride. She loved him in the most difficult times. Following his excommunication, when he felt that church leaders and neighbors and some of his own plural wives did not understand, she ministered to him when others walked away. From 1867, when church leaders began alienating um, alienating Amasa and walked away. Um, it was Mariah who was always there. I believe Mariah's feeling about the teachings of the church changed during that 10 year period. Mariah's experience was somewhat kind of like Emma Smith's. There came a point when Emma's unconditional love of her family and her husband Joseph conflicted with church leadership and doctrine. Emma had stood by Joseph throughout his trials, but she could not follow the church leadership and go west with the saints. Mariah had supported and sustained Emma on every assignment and mission that the brethren had asked him to serve. Yet when the brethren of the church excommunicated Amasa and severed all ties with him, Amos, uh, Mariah did not. Like Emma, Mariah's ties to her husband were much deeper than doctrine. And because of this, Mariah may have struggled with her ties to the church. After Amos' death, friend, uh, Mariah's son Francis Marion stayed close to his mother, trying to help her see things differently. In the book, John Tanner and His Family, written by George S. Tanner, there is an insightful description of Mariah. But gentle, constant Mariah, who had always known him the longest and loved him the best, but did not turn her back on Aaron and Amasa, unlike other wives who had married for a principle, Mariah had married a man and she proposed to stick to him. There were many times she wondered if Amasa loved the church and his work more than he loved her. But regardless of that, 
It was Amasa that Moriah loved above all else. He needed her many times in the past, and when the enemy was closing in and he felt discouraged, but he needed her more still when the present crisis was his, when his main enemy was himself. She did not forsake him. In 1887, Francis Marion accompanied his mother on a trip to see the sights of Kirtland, Ohio, and visit her aging sister, Matilda Randall. Matilda Randall. It had been 50 years since they had seen each other, and Mariah spent the next six weeks with her older sister, Matilda. Mariah probably remembered that Kirtland, Ohio was her first great journey as a 15-year-old girl and now she was 69 years old, and Kirtland was now to be her last great journey. In Mariah's later years, she lived with her son, Francis Marion, and her daughter, Josephine Coons, in Salt Lake City, where she died on May the 3rd, 1906, at the age of 87. As I think of the dash that separates birth and death, I want to remember that on this earth, we most often judge others by their actions that they take. However, the Lord judges us by what is in our hearts when we take those actions. Mariah's birth date, 1818. Her death date, 1906. As I contemplate Mariah's death, I see a woman who lived and died as a loving wife and mother. She had endured patience of many, many trials, most of which were not of her making. Yet she stayed true to Jesus Christ's greatest commandment to love one another as I have loved you. And that is why she never left Amos's side. As we look at this photograph with Mariah and her young teenage son, Lyman Coons, sitting on the porch, I wonder what would I ask Mariah if I were in Lyman's place? What would Mariah say to me or to you? Let me conclude with the words that Mariah wrote 150 years ago that were contained in a second letter she sent to Amasa from Winter Quarters. I am very anxious to see you, she writes, but your mission must be completed first, that we might live in a union, and my little ones will be spared, that we may meet again to see the good days, my prayers and best wishes, you have always. Mariah Tanner Lyman. Thank you.